Well, good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks so much for joining us uh, for the first uh, portion of our day-long conference on uh, the intellectual legacy and career and life legacy of George F. Kennan uh, in the 21st century. Um, this is a topic uh, that is, of course, of particular importance to those of us here at the Kennan Institute, not least because we are at the institute that bears his family name and which he co-founded, um, but because uh, the ethos uh, that he brought to his work in uh, Russian area studies, in U.S. diplomacy, foreign policy, uh, strategy, uh, is, uh, in my view and I think in our collective view, uh, more needed now than ever. Um, so this is a, an important uh, and it's a, a significant and fitting opportunity. It's one that was made possible thanks to the generosity of the Nadav Foundation of Leonid Nevzlin. Uh, I think he will be here a bit later today. Um, I want to recognize also Diana Davis Spencer, who makes all of our work possible, who's with us here representing the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, um, and two members of the Kennan family, Grace Kennan, who serves uh, on our advisory council, and Joan Kennan. So thank you both for being with us today. Um, why we're here in a broader sense, uh, I think, is maybe a bit of an irony or at least a, a twist on fate in that we are sitting in the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for International Scholars. So some of you had to pass through the government uh, airport-style security on the first floor uh, may have been reminded. This is, in fact, a national memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. And yet here we are celebrating the legacy of George F. Kennan. Um, it's the 100th year since Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, the defining early speech, if you will, of the liberal international order as Wilson uh, saw it, uh, the beginning uh, of the era of Wilsonianism uh, in American foreign policy. Of course, this is the 50th anniversary year of the Wilson Center itself, which we uh, mark with this event and a whole series of events this year. Um, and we'll continue to honor uh, and continue the mission uh, of scholarship in the public service, but there is a certain irony, or at least a question, uh, baked into uh, the uh, conjunction of these two great names in American foreign policy, Kennan and Wilson. Kennan, some might argue, defined the intellectual and political pole most distant from Wilsonianism. If Wilson, for instance, built an ideology on defending ideals, Kennan shrewdly dissected ideology from practice. Where Wilson cherished rules and anointed their guardians, Kennan looked to interests and admonished rule makers not to deal in absolutes. Where Wilsonianism lofted most often towards universalism, Kennan brought forth an enduring conception of what was particular to a nation, a time, and a place. And he did so, of course, with timeless eloquence. In fact, we don't speak of Kennanism, but Kennan might be thought of as defining a very different school of thought in international relations, or maybe a rejection of the school itself. Kennan himself, in a 1953 speech at Princeton, later published in the Atlantic Magazine, uh, dismissed the very notion of there being a field, whether it was called political science, international relations, public administration, those in which Wilson himself was a famed and founding practitioner. He said, international affairs is not a science, period. It is a mistake to think of international affairs as anything outside the regular context of life, as anything which a man could hope to understand without having to understand things much more basic. There is no such thing as foreign affairs in the abstract. Now he went on, and here one begins to see where a respect, if not a commonality of view, might actually have grown up between these two great thinkers. Kennan writes, let no one be permitted to think that he is learned in something called a science of international relations unless he is learned in the essentials of the political process from the grassroots up and has been taught to look soberly and unsparingly, but also with charity and sympathy at his fellow human beings. And in comes Woodrow Wilson, the ultimate educated man of his time, the ultimate man of ideas in the political world, and certainly learned in the political process and about his fellow man. So perhaps it is fitting that we're here to examine and celebrate Kennan's ideas at this time and in this place, the Wilson Center. Now indulge me for one more moment before I turn the floor over to this distinguished panel and consider what might actually be more important, which is what these two men, 
at opposite ends of the spectrum of ideas and at opposite ends of the century in some respects, one a diplomat, one a politician, both scholars had in common. Both had distinguished careers in public policy and in the world of ideas, uniting these two pursuits like very few others before, perhaps fewer even since. They were each masters of persuasion, equipped with vision and with courage, and at times for both this meant standing solitary against the dominant political tide. Their political and intellectual bravery in the ivory tower or in the pages of obscure academic journals would have been one thing, still remarkable, but in public life it was quite another altogether, and this distinguished both. From their private papers, we know that they were each given to degrees of reflection, uncertainty, seldom seen by the wider public, but perhaps endemic to their condition as sometime scholars called to serve in the affairs of states. There is, of course, much more to be asked and surmised on this and related topics, frankly, with or without reference to the somewhat eccentric construction of Wilson and Kennan, but after all, we're in the building uh, which bears Wilson's name. Our conference and our work here today uh, will continue what has been, I think, at best uh, an appetizer, but perhaps not even that, uh, with distinguished panels examining Kennan and U.S.-Russia relations, uh, policy planning after Kennan, and Kennan and the wider contemporary international scene. It's my privilege now to launch and moderate our first panel with four very distinguished speakers whose full bios I could not possibly do justice, uh, and so they're uh, before you along with photos in the, in the packet. Um, we'll go a little bit out of the order uh, in the agenda. We will, however, begin with Dr. Andrei Kortunov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. Uh, then we'll go to Dr. Angela Stent, Director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies uh, at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Um, then we'll come to Dr. Ivan Kurila, Professor and Director of the Department of Development uh, partnership at the European <coughs> University of St. Petersburg, and last but certainly not least, um, to the very most recent occupant of George Kennan's sometime residence, Svaso House, and his job ambassador of the United States, the Russian Federation, the Honorable John Teft. So, Andre, kick us off. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, th uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, let me start with saying that uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Every time I come to Canon, I feel at home. And this is uh, probably uh, because uh, when I came to this uh, city for the first time, and that was uh, in the mid-80s, uh, the first uh, American I saw outside of the then Soviet embassy was Herb Ellison, then director of the Canon Institute. And it was uh, on the mall at Smithsonian Building. But uh, definitely it was a very important experience for me. And uh, we had many projects with Canon, and I really appreciate the hospitality and the commitment of this particular institution. As a footnote uh, to what uh, Matt uh, has just said, I should inform you that uh, <coughs> <coughs> together uh, with the <coughs> Kudrin Foundation, we have just released uh, a report on the centennial of 14 uh, points of uh, Wilson, which was presented at the uh, Gaidar Forum. and. Uh, uh, led to a discussion in Russia, but uh, I have to say that uh, at least uh, in our part of the world, the ideas of Woodrow Wilson are still alive, if not well, <laughs> but they are clearly alive and uh, we are still fighting for some of them. Uh, since uh, uh, my fellow, fellow panelists are in a much better uh, position uh, to talk uh, about the legacy of, uh, uh, of George Cannon, uh, Definitely, this is a panel of historians. I would uh, limit myself uh, to just uh, two points. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of canon uh, and the method of canon. And uh, to share my views on where I think uh, the method and uh, uh, the concept are still applicable and whether they have to be reviewed and probably revised. But before doing that, uh, let me uh, share with you uh, just one very personal uh, recollection. Uh, I uh, read the long telegram uh, of Kennan uh, when I uh, uh, was accepted uh, by the Institute of USA and Kansas Studies 
of the Soviet Academy of Sciences uh, uh, as a, a postgraduate student. And one of the privileges uh, that we had as uh, uh, postgraduate students of this institution was that we got uh, access uh, uh, to so-called um, classified literature. <coughs> Literatura для служебного пользования. If uh, uh, some of you, you know, probably remember these times, you should know what it means. Uh, so at our institute, there was a special room which was called Spetschran, special repository, uh, where you could get access uh, to uh, American, European books uh, on international relations. You couldn't take them out, but you could read them there. So since I wanted to write my thesis on the history of the Cold War, uh, I thought that I should uh, really dig into how the whole thing started. And I selected two documents, which I considered to be uh, the most important <coughs> to understand the origins uh, of the uh, era. Uh, the first document uh, was uh, uh, the Fulton speech of uh, Winston Churchill, and the second was the long telegram of uh, uh, George Cannon. Uh, and these two documents uh, had uh, very different impressions on me, and I still remember. Uh, the Fulton speech of Winston Churchill was uh, a beautiful piece of truly British English language. <laughs> very stylish, very rich. It was almost like a poem. And uh, I got uh, a lot of uh, aesthetical pleasure when I uh, read uh, this uh, important document. But the uh, long telegram had a very different impression on me. I was shocked. Uh, not uh, as much uh, uh, by the recipes that uh, uh, Cannon Sorry. offered <laughs> to the uh, U.S. Uh, decision makers, but rather uh, with a very unsentimental, uh, very rational, and I would even say very brutal uh, description of the Soviet system. And of course, at that point, I couldn't uh, subscribe. Maybe, maybe wait just one moment. I have no idea what that is. Is this a microphone or is it construction? Uh, it, it sounds very much like a drill vibration <laughs> being picked up by the uh, uh, by the AV. It's a Ken and Jen fix off. <laughs> 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 uh, what, what's so wonderful is that no one has said listening device. It's like, <laughs> what a rare gathering. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not honored <laughs> to be bugged. <laughs> uh, but let me say that... Um, no, oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> opportunity knocks, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I think uh, I think we have someone on that 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 will be made to stop as absolutely soon as we can. Welcome right. to a United States government building. <laughs> <laughs> Infrastructure project. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm well, well, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so do, do your best. I, uh, I, think, okay. I think we're working on shutting it off. Um, and of course, you know, I I, I couldn't accept um, uh, this description of my world, the world that I understood, the world I belonged to, and uh, uh, it was shocking because, uh, of course, there was a thought on the the back of my head: what if? this guy is right. Mm. And everything mm. I was taught, mm. everything that I got from TV screens, uh, from the books I read from my teachers at school and uh, at the university, everything was wrong. Of course, you know, there is a natural instinct of self-preservation, and I was trying to build some trenches to defend mm -hmm. my universe, my vision of the world. He cannot be right. Mm. He should be wrong. Why? Well, and I, I still remember that I had at least uh, three lines of defense against Cannon and his long telegram. The first was that you believe that uh, the Soviet system is oppressive, that it is a dictatorship imposed on the Russian people. But can this concept explain 
the history of the Soviet Union. Did the Soviets win the war just because it was fear? It was the oppression of Stalin? Or was there something different? Something maybe more profound? How can we explain the Soviet art, the Soviet literature? Is it just because propaganda ordered these people to follow certain lines? Or was there something there which was authentic, which really reflected some fundamentals uh, of the Russian soil, of the Russian heart? My second line was, OK, probably indeed communism was imposed on the Russian people. Probably Russians imposed communists, uh, communism uh, in, in their own term on Central Eastern Europe. But how then can we explain the popularity of communist ideas all over the world? What about strong communist parties in Western Europe, in France, in Italy, in Spain? What about communism in China? Did it have its own rules, roots, or was it imposed on China by the Soviet Union? What about communism in Vietnam? What about uh, leftist ideas in the Middle East or in Africa? So there should be something wrong in how Kennan describes communism as a phenomenon. And finally, of course, my last line of defense was that maybe he was right about Stalin and this period, but, you know, the Soviet Union matured. And, of course, late Brezhnev was very different from Stalin. We spoke about communism with a human face. And, of course, at that point, many of us, me including, believed that communism or the Soviet system could be reformed, that uh, we would uh, meet somewhere in uh, maybe in a remote future and the two systems will merge into something socially oriented, but at the same time more liberal and more pluralistic. So, 10 years later, it turned out that I was wrong and he was right. Mm. The Soviet Union failed to reform itself. And uh, though late Brezhnev was uh, different from early Stalin, the fundamentals of the system remained the same. And uh, of course, uh, Ken was one of very few scholars uh, who predicted the evolution and the ultimate collapse of the communist ideology. But I would say even more to his credit, there were few scholars uh, who predicted uh, the failure of communism and uh, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, but in most cases, uh, they were thinking uh, about uh, other uh, reasons for this failure. For example, if you take Amalric and his book about the Soviet Union in, uh, uh, in 1984, he spoke about a war between China and the Soviet Union, and that's how the regime, in his view, uh, had to fail. If you take Alain Dancos, uh, she spoke about the change in demographics of the Soviet Union, and she predicted uh, a revolt of Central Asia. But uh, Kennan was much closer to the real evolution because he spoke about uh, failing Soviet Union and failing communism, not because of some revolt of uh, national minorities or external factors, but he argued that uh, the system will fail uh, when the Russian people will uh, deprive it of its uh, faith and when the system loses its legitimacy. And that was exactly what happened uh, in 1991. Because indeed, when the Communist Party was banned, there was nobody to go to barricades. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union had more than 20 million people. Nobody wanted to defend the Communist Party leadership. Nobody was ready to start a civil war. And I think that this prediction tells us tons about the intellectual power of George Kennan, about his ability to predict and his ability to foresee developments. So having said that, let me now uh, shift uh, uh, to the uh, concept 
uh, which is uh, often discussed right now uh, when we talk about relations between the United States and Russia. Containment. Containment is very popular in this city these days, and for good reasons. And they refer to Kennan uh, when they talk about containment, because he is arguably the author of the concept. Now here, I think uh, we really need to have a very serious discussion. To what extent the concept of containment is applicable to the current situation in the world and to the current uh, status of the relations between Moscow and Washington. And let me limit myself just to three observations why, in my opinion, this concept uh, needs uh, serious thinking and uh, probably serious revisions. First of all, when Kennan wrote about the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was an ascendant power. In a way, it was a revolutionary power because uh, it was committed to changing the existing system of international relations with something different. It had an ideology. It had a very different approach to the fundamentals of the world politics. Maybe in the 1970s, the Soviet Union was already a revisionist power. It didn't have the intention to change the system at large, but it wanted to get a better place for itself in this system. Now, what is Russia? Is it a revolutionary power? Certainly not. It doesn't have an alternative system in mind which could replace the liberal system that emerged after the end of the Second World War. Is it a revisionist power? I doubt it. I think China is a revisionist power in many ways, but not Russia. Russia is not an extending power. So I think that when we talk about Russia today, uh, counterintuitively, it is, it is a status quo power, which uh, sometimes refers to spoilers tactics to make it case. Uh, even if you take the Ukrainian situation, uh, the stand explanation in Moscow is that it was a purely defensive action. So when we're thinking about containment, we should uh, make a qualification because uh, these days, it's not an extending, uh, aggressive, revisionist, or revolutionary power which has to be contained by the United States. It's a very different pattern of international behavior you have to deal with. Uh, my second observation is uh, containment is clear when you have a more or less well-defined bipolar world. It's either them or us. It's us against them. You contain them, they try to contain you. But is containment possible? Can contain be efficient in a multipolar or polycentric world? Can and should the United States contain both Russia and China at the same time? Is it doable? What implications it will have for the U.S. interests? Will it uh, create new opportunities or will it create new limitations? Are you forging a stronger Russian-Chinese alliance today? Can you combine a containment of Russia and fight against international terrorism? Again, it's not that clear. I think this is something that uh, has to be explored in much more detail than it is usually done. And uh, my final uh, observation uh, is that, of course, the phenomenon, of, and this is reflected in your paper, uh, the phenomenon of, uh, of the global world is something that puts the whole idea of containment into a different perspective. If you want to contain something, you need to sort of isolate it. You put something into a container, so to say. If, for example, if it is a, a poison, you put it in, into a container and you isolate it uh, from uh, the outside. Now, when we have uh, a situation uh, with porous borders, uh, with internet, uh, uh, when states lose monopoly over information, how can you do that? It is a different ball game. 
I don't want to say that it is impossible, but it requires a very different set of instruments, tools, and the very uh, different uh, uh, capacity, institutional capacities of those who would like to pursue the policy of containment. So I think that this is something that has to be discussed. Maybe today uh, these issues will be, uh, will be uh, uh, handled. And let me just finish uh, with, uh, with, the, with the method. And uh, I keep thinking, you know, if, yeah, if uh, Kennan were sitting here, uh, what would he be most critical about the current situation, be it in the United States or in Russia, about foreign policy? And I think that there are three issues. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, uh, Kennan would be very skeptical about this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, rather blunt, unsophisticated nationalism which we see emerging in the world. In a way, Kennan, in my opinion, uh, was one of the most un American scholars. He was more critical of the United States than other gurus of international relations like, uh, you know, Brzezinski or uh, Kissinger uh, or uh, Richard Pipes. And, and I have my own theory about why it happened. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, he didn't have to prove to himself that he was a true American. But that is not politically correct, so I, I don't impose my <laughs> view on anyone here. Uh, second, uh, uh, my, my, my take on, on Kennan that he would be very, very critical of the uh, current uh, transactionalism in international relations because he was about strategy. And transactionalism uh, is definitely something that he would, not, uh, he would not appreciate. And finally, I think that uh, this intellectual rigor of Kennan, this ability uh, to introspect, to reflect, again, is something that we are missing. We are missing this uh, in Moscow, for sure. Uh, I think that you are missing it here in Washington. I'm afraid that this is something which is missed in other capitals of uh, major powers. And finally, the very last point, uh, I think that uh, uh, we always believe that our days are the most difficult. Uh, it's the hardest challenge to our respective civilizations or countries or nations, and this is natural. He lived in a very difficult world, but I think that we will not um, we will not disagree that he has he had at least one major uh, comparative advantage over us. Uh, he uh, operated in a relatively stable environment, so he can have long term planning. Uh, the concept of containment was targeted uh, so that it could work in. 10, 20, 30 years from the point of its inception. So the question uh, which is important uh, to ask ourselves, do we have the time that Kennan had? Uh, do we have the time in Moscow? Do we have time in Washington? Uh, do we have time in the world to pursue such a long-term strategy uh, which would uh, bear fruit only in a couple of decades from now? Because if we do not have time, then we should think about something very different. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I'm sorry for being. You no, know, when you when you when you <laughs> talked about uh, the relative stability of his environment and and the long term, I thought you were going to suggest something along the lines of if you read the Gaddis bio, he goes off to his farm on the weekends and you know comes back Monday morning and sort of then deals with the problems of international <laughs> affairs, which of course now you know if we go home for the weekend, it's plugged into our iPhones. Uh, <laughs> but then you talk in terms of decades, and you're right about that too, Angela. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm delighted to be here. In uh, 2011, I took part in a conference at the Kennan Institute, again, uh, remembering George Kennan, talking about his legacy um, with some different cast of characters, but um, it's, it's great to be back again. You know, listening to you, Andre, I remember in 1992, having a session at the Kennan Institute of Kritika is Sama Kritika, why didn't any of us foresee the collapse of the Soviet Union? <laughs> and we all sat around tearing our hair, and we had, I think it was John Mearsheimer here, um, saying, oh, you Russian scholars, Soviet scholars, uh -huh. you know you know what you were talking about. And so finally we said, you know, if Gorbachev himself didn't foresee the end of the Soviet Union, why should we have foreseen it? But um, it is indeed, you're right. George Kennan, I think, was much more astute in that. Um, so um, I want to talk uh, about uh, George Kennan's legacy and then talk more about how much has changed and hasn't changed in terms of his description of the Russian, the Soviet political system. 
Um, last fall, uh, the BBC invited me to do a podcast re-examining the Wreath Lectures, which George Kennan gave in 1957 uh, at Oxford University, and they were entitled <laughs> Russia, the Atom, and the West. Um, so I do want to begin talking about, this is now 10 years after the Mr. X article and the height of the Khrushchev era. Um, but before I do that, I have to um, mention one thing, which is, as an academic, I want to highlight how George Kennan felt about being at Oxford University during the seven or eight weeks um, that he was in residence at Balliol College. And I get this from John Gaddis's excellent biography um, of George Kennan. So Mr. Kennan had imagined the discussion at the high table at Balliol College to be that they would be profoundly intellectual, uplifting, refined, erudite, and moral. And to his deep disappointment when he went to these high table dinners, they were full of idle gossip and what he called academic tittle-tattle. Um, and his verdict on Oxford was, I have never seen such backbiting, such fury, such factions in my life. <laughs> Fortunately, of course, American universities aren't like that. Oh, <laughs> Kennan began his wreath lectures by admitting that he had been wrong about the weakness of the Soviet economy in 1947. And he wrote, today, or he said, today I am free to confess that Soviet economic progress in the face of many handicaps has surpassed anything I would have thought possible. So I want to just quote this to remind us that we have a tendency in the West to underestimate Russia's ability to advance economically um, since, uh, uh, certainly since uh, 2014 even, despite the lack of modernization and widespread corruption, uh, which continues today. Um, I think Americans and Europeans didn't foresee the degree to which Russia was able to deal, for instance, with the post-Crimea sanctions and recover through a combination of astute financial management and rising oil prices. So again, I think we underestimate at our peril Russia's ability to pull through to survive um, and, and to continue making progress. And I see Chris Miller here. He has an excellent book about to come out about Putin economics, which I recommend to everyone. Um, now, in his wreath lectures, Kennan expressed his criticism of and skepticism about NATO. And of course, that was one of the themes uh, throughout um, <coughs> his professional life. Um, he had never intended um, his containment prescriptions to focus on military containment. Um, rather, political and economic containment were what was needed, he said. He criticized in these lectures the way that the United States was dealing with the Soviet Union. He said it, the US was erroneously focused on a non-existent Soviet threat to Western Europe. So he was really quite uh, uh, clear about that. Um, he admonished Washington for not focusing more on the economic reconstruction of Western Europe and overemphasizing the military elements, overemphasizing NATO's role. He also criticized the nuclear buildup, but he was not a proponent of nuclear disarmament. So he was not a global zero person. He believed that it was important to have the nuclear weapons, um, but to uh, restrict um, how many weapons one had. And he concluded with a warning for Washington uh, and he said, let us not look to the council tables of NATO to provide the basic strength on which the security of the Western world must rest. So now let me turn to what George Kennan wrote about the nature of the Soviet regime and its relevance for understanding contemporary Russia and US-Russian relations. Um, how relevant are Kennan's writings for um, us understanding the uh, political system in Russia today and the foreign policy which the current Russian government pursues. Um, now, we must remember, and this is of course clear in the long telegram and of course in the Mr. X article, that Kennan believed that the Soviet system was, if you like, a pernicious combination of czarist absolutism and expansionism, and that was, this was reinforced by Marxism-Leninism, again, as Marxism was interpreted in the Soviet Union as opposed to in other uh, countries in the world. Soviet power, he said, was a product of ideology and circumstance, and the essence of this ideology was suspicion of the West. Um, and again, this is now from the Mr. X article. For ideology, as we have seen, he wrote, uh, taught, uh, taught those Soviets that the outside world was hostile and that it was their duty eventually to overthrow the political forces beyond their borders. The powerful hands of Russian history and tradition 
reached up to sustain them in this feeling. So again, this combination of um, Tsarist absolutism of Russian history uh, as interpreted by the Soviet leaders uh, overlaid uh, with Marxism-Leninism. Um, so he stressed the Russian dialectical view of the world, the, um, the idea that Russia would always, the Soviet Union would always be in conflict with the West, that that was inevitable. Uh, and then, of course, he wrote about the Stalinist system as being repressive, uh, and you have a population, in his view, that was subservient to the dictator's whims. And again, one more sentence from uh, the article. Um, like the white dog before the phonograph, they, the Soviet people, hear only their master's voice. And if they are to be called off from the purposes last dictated to, to, to them, it is the master that must call them off. So very much listening to whatever Stalin said. And then if he changed his mind, if Soviet policy changed, once he had it was explained to the Soviet population, then they had to accept it. So this, these two factors, essential antipathy toward the West and domestic authoritarian rule, led uh, Kennan, of course, to conclude in the article, this means that we're going to continue for a long time to find the Russians difficult to deal with. Um, and, you know, 71 years later, I'm not sure that anyone would disagree with that. So how much relevance does this have today? Uh, more, obviously, than I think some people would like to admit. Um, so the biggest difference between now and then is the absence of uh, an official universalist ideology. Um, Andre already alluded to that, and the absence of a communist party. You know, United Russia is not the communist party of the Soviet Union. Uh, Vladimir Putin has certainly created a new national idea. Some people would call that an ideology, but it's not designed to have universal appeal. Rather, the idea of Russian exceptionalism, exceptionalism and the idea of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, um, has, uh, and Russia also as a leader of a conservative international movement, uh, as the protector of traditional values, these are all part of this new Putin national idea. This is designed to appeal to the millions of Russians who live outside of the Russian Federation, uh, either in the post-Soviet space or in the West, and also it's designed to appeal to a mixed group of non-Russian conservatives, Eurosceptics, and leftists who dislike America and the European Union. So this new Russian national idea does not have broad international appeal, but it's targeted towards specific groups who reject the current Euro-Atlantic order and seek to disrupt it. As for the Russian domestic political system, obviously Vlad Vladimir Putin is no Stalin. But as his spokesman Dmitry Peskov recently said, Putin is an absolute leader in the public's opinion, the leader of the political Olympus, uh, with whom at this stage it is unlikely that anyone else could compete. And Andre and I have both heard uh, Mr. Valodin, the speaker of the Duma, uh, say at one of these Valdai gatherings, Putin is Russia and Russia is Putin. Without Putin, there is no Russia. So we do have, to some extent, a cult of the leader in Russia and a public that largely supports him. He has very high approval rates, um, and a public that blames other people in other countries, particularly the West, for their problems. Um, and then I think another difference, obviously, with the Soviet system, and this, again, comes back to the lack of a communist party. Unlike in the Soviet systems, there aren't institutions in today's Russian political system um, as there were in Soviet times, and informal rules are much more important than any of the formal institutions, probably more so than in at least for the last century uh, of Russian history. And what about the dialectical view of the West? Well, we had a brief period, I suppose not so brief, maybe 20 years or so, beginning when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, and I would say maybe ending at the end of Putin's first term in office, when Moscow did seek cooperation with the West, um, and the West sought cooperation with Moscow, but today the United States has returned as the main enemy, the Glavni Protivnik. You can see that uh, in official documents. You can listen to it. Um, and, of course, if you look at the current you know, nuclear posture review or the current US new national defense strategy from the United States, Russia is also now mentioned as a major threat in a way that it hasn't been uh, certainly since uh, the middle uh, period of the Gorbachev era. Um, and um, so if you, again, um, read Vladimir Putin's speech in 
2007 at the Munich Security Conference, if you listen to much of what is said now, uh, the U.S. is the main enemy. It's trying to, quote, unquote, cut off a juicy slice of Russia, uh, Russian territory, and it is actively seeking regime change. Again, this is what you hear from Russian officials. Um, so those are some similarities, but let me come to some more differences. Um, and one of them is economic. Russia is today integrated into the global economy. So that the kind of economic containment that George Kennan was proposing um, in the late 1940s is no longer possible. Um, the United States and the European Union have imposed sanctions on Russia, but China and the rest of the BRICS and many other countries, of course, have refused to follow suit. Um, so it's impossible to isolate Russia economically today to contain Russia economically. Um, that, that's not possible. Um, and then I think another major difference um, is uh, contrast to the Cold War. In contrast to U.S.-Russian relations, in much of the rest of the world, Russia pursues a very pragmatic, non-ideological policy in contrast to the Cold War years. And I think the Middle East, as we see today, is a prime example of this. Russia has stepped into a vacuum uh, created by, really, the withdrawal of the United States in the area. Russia maintains strong ties to both Shia and Sunni countries in the region, and, of course, to Israel. Um, as well as uh, with, to groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the, and the Kurds. Uh, Russia is the main regional power broker there, precisely because it is comfortable dealing with all sides to the many different conflicts in the region and because its policy is not based on, um, on ideology, but it's very prag pragmatic and, I would argue, quite successful. So let me finish now by returning to U.S.-Russian relations, um, which do, in some ways, obviously resemble the Cold War era, in contrast to Russia's relations with many other countries. Although Kennan believed that communism had reinforced historical Russian actions and existing beliefs rather than changing them, he believed that once communism collapsed, the U.S. would have a chance to develop new and better relations with Russia. Um, hence his criticism of U.S. policy after the Soviet collapse, and he was very critical, and, of course, his opposition to NATO enlargement, and his admonition that the United States should be seeking to develop a stronger partnership with Russia uh, rather than, um, again, ex expanding NATO to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we'll probably come back to the NATO question again, um, and there is, of course, a belief both in the, some people in the United States and in Russia, uh, that the West is at fault for the deteriorating relationship with Russia. It's to blame that the United States is to, is to blame for this. Um, uh, unlike George Kennan, I do not believe that NATO enlargement was, quote unquote, a fateful error, um, nor do I believe that had NATO disbanded uh, in the early 90s, that somehow the US-Russian relationship would be much better than it is today. Um, obviously, the United States has made many mistakes in its policy toward Russia since the Soviet collapse. Um, I've written a book, The Limits of Partnership, uh, where I go into um, a, a discussion of this and why it's been so difficult um, to create a more productive U.S.-Russian relationship since the Soviet collapse. But the reason why U.S.-Russian relations are so problematic, I would argue, has much more to do with long-term structural factors. Um, some of which George Kennan outlined very clearly than with any specific actions taken by either side. The United States and Russia have fundamentally different views of the major drivers of world politics. They have a different understanding of the meaning of sovereignty, which is largely based on their contrasting historical experiences. And while these differences do not preclude the possibility of U.S.-Russian cooperation, where goals and interests are clearly defined and aligned, and of agreement on issues of mutual concern, it does mean that there are significant barriers to advancing the relationship to the kind of broad partnership um, in the way that George Kennan, perhaps because he so admired Russian culture and many of the Russian people that, uh, that he met, in a way that uh, um, uh, he maybe didn't fully appreciate um, since he was still living in the time when, uh, you know, when communism predominated. So I'll stop. Thank you, Angela. Yvonne. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, well, I'm a historian, and my first uh, 
specialization, specialization was Russian American relations in the 19th century. So I will start with a uh, with a period far, far uh, before George Kennan the Younger was born, and even before the George uh, Kennan the Elder traveled to Russia. Uh, but my major uh, goal is to speak about the opportunities and limits, limitations uh, of the experts' role in the U.S.-Russian relations, and you know I will take the Kennan example to to illustrate what I want to say. No, I promised to start with the uh, middle of the 19th century. In 1850, uh, the former governor of Tennessee, Neil Brown, was appointed American minister to St. Petersburg. Uh, he came to Russia without, of course, without knowledge of Russian, without knowledge of French, uh, which was a language of uh, Russian court, uh, with uh, no you know, means and money uh, that were you know, needed to maintain the high... Uh, level of uh, uh, of uh, you know of court life, so he was secluded in his uh, embassy, uh, met almost uh, nobody. But it it was in the middle of the last years of the Nicholas the First uh, reign, which was uh, you know the Russian historians call it the Dark Seven Years, Mrachne Similetia. It was a period of reaction after the European revolutions of the uh, eighteen. 48, 49, uh, and it was a part of the domestic uh, froze, free freeze. Uh, so Neil Brown uh, sent a series of uh, dispatches back to Washington uh, complaining about the uh, Russian government, uh, Russian society. He said this is a uh, omnipresence espionage, uh, omnipresence censorship, uh, and even the, uh, the Petersburg is a dull place where the, even the birds cannot uh, sing without the government permission. <laughs> and he was, you know, uh, he was very, he, he wrote very gloomy picture, was, was a, in part at least a real uh, picture of Nicholas II, but, uh, you know, <laughs> Nicholas I, of course, yeah. Uh, and But at the same time, uh, it's uh, pictured uh, his personal position as uh, somebody isolated in the Russian uh, capital. Well, uh, 85 years after uh, Neil Brown's mission to Russia, uh, George Kennan, uh, with uh, Ambassador Bullitt, uh, arrived to Russia as, you know, in the first uh, American mission to the Soviet Russia. And Kennan, as a secretary of the legation, found uh, these uh, dispatches by uh, Neil Brown in the archives of the embassy archives. And he was very excited, and he said this is a, a direct uh, description of the Soviet Union in the middle of the 30s, of the 1930s. He compiled the dispatch, which was signed <laughs> by uh, Ambassador Bullitt, and sent back to Washington as a description of uh, the Soviet Union in 1935. He just changed it, uh, the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union, and he put a saying. That's actually it's published in the Foreign Relations of the United States for 1935, I think, 36. Yeah, you should check it. <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Kennan, George Kennan, uh, liked that story, and he repeated it several times. He repeated it, as I learned from John Geddes' uh, excellent book, he repeated it at least five times in, in different <coughs> occasions, including his speech to the uh, National War College. And one of the most interesting uh, use of it was in 1952, when um, he was an ambassador to Moscow, and when uh, American security uh, uh, discovered the listening device in the uh, study room of, uh, of American ambassador, and asked him to read something aloud because they did not know how the listening device was working, so they probably <coughs> it was uh, resonated to the ambassador's voice. So they asked him to, to read something aloud, so he read his that dispatch about the Russian. And so he used it uh, several times. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, if you look on the, the whole situation, it's maybe strange that the uh, Stalin Soviet Union was so resembling the Russian Empire of the middle of the 19th century. You know, from the just the by common sense, you will see that, okay, there are probably some resemblance, but of course the Soviet Union was not a Russian Empire on many grounds. 
and that, uh, and especially, uh, and, and, and then we can say that uh, Kennan uh, was in the Soviet Union again at the time of uh, the probably the worst domestically uh, for the Soviet Union. And he was a uh, first mission of uh, he, he first was the first mission in the middle of the thirties, the time of consolidation of Stalin power, the beginning of the Moscow processes and beginning of the repression wave. And then he was in the late uh, 40s during the start of the Cold War and the, in the middle of the, probably the worst time of the Cold War in 1952. So his, uh, of course, his own experience of living in the Soviet Union at that time was uh, very much like uh, living in the Nicholas, uh, the first um, dark seven years, uh, the worst probably time of domestically for, for, for the Russian Empire in the 19th century. So he found a lot of uh, resemblance. But on the other hand, uh, uh, of course, that was just one possible vision of, of the Russian Empire or of the Soviet Union. And there was also the periods of uh, reforms, periods of uh, liberalization, both in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, which uh, Kennan did not experience by the time of he, he left uh, the uh, ambassadorship. And so his, uh, I would say that uh, his um, vision of the Soviet Union by the time when he left it in 1952 uh, was, uh, was one-sided. Later, he developed much more, uh, you know, three-dimensional vision of the Soviet Union. He continued to study it as a scholar. He continued to study Russian foreign policy, history of Russia, history of Russian foreign policy, and he de developed much more nuanced and uh, multifaceted, uh, say, uh, vision of the Soviet Union. And that was exactly the time when he started to criticize American foreign policy. As an uh, advisor, as a policy planning person, he was most successful when his view on the Soviet Union was uh, very, I would say, not one-dimensional, but very uh, uh, strictly uh, limited by his experience. Mm. And that is actually uh, maybe seen as a paradox, but it uh, brings us to the kind of theoretical view. Um, the French uh, Bulgarian uh, scholar Tsvetan Todorov uh, in the uh, 80s uh, published a book, uh, The Conquest of America, where he, uh, he stated very important uh, in theoretical uh, approach that there are three dimensions of the international relations, of the rel relations between every, uh, every two uh, countries, two nations. Uh, which are uh, mutually independent, this independent variable. Uh, the knowledge about the, the other country, the attitude to the other country, and the action, the readiness to act towards the other country. And he insisted that there is no direct link between the knowledge about the other country and what you want or don't want to do about that other country. So it means that political uh, world make a decision not just based on the uh, knowledge of the other country. The knowledge that expert can provide may resonate or not resonate with the other uh, factors that politi political world uh, uses in, in the defining the policy in, uh, towards the other country. Uh, George Kennan was uh, very fortunate that his uh, vision uh, during late 40s get uh, in the resonation with the uh, Washington uh, you know, lack of shortage of uh, of the ideas in the late 40s. When he sent his long telegram and then published his ex uh, article, it was a big shortage of, of uh, ideas in Washington, but not ideas about the Soviet Union per se, but the, no, uh, but the ideas about the future role of the United States. What should be the role of the United States in the situation when uh, Great Britain collapsed as a, uh, as a number one power? when the United States suddenly uh, found itself as a leader of the free world and what to do, how to deal with the foreign affairs. And Kennan's ideas were just in time to, to define, uh, to the Washington community, political community, to define the new role of the United States. And that was, uh, that's why uh, his suggestion, his uh, ideas uh, were so timely and we were, uh, were praised and taken into uh, political uh, agenda and political, uh, you know, political planning stuff. But soon after that, as we all know, like 
just few years after that, uh, Kennan started to criticize that approach. And this, uh, he, and uh, his criticism was based on, on much better knowledge of the Soviet Union, but it was not taken into account. Because now he did not resonate with what Washington uh, political circles needed to, uh, needed to have. And this is about, uh, it takes me back to my, you know, initial uh, question or idea, what, uh, experts, what is the expert's role, expert in the foreign policy uh, world? If you know uh, a lot about uh, Russia or we in Russia, if you know a lot about the United States, can we influence the political decision or not? Because political decisions are not based, again, not based on about the knowledge. It's based about the domestic concerns, about the uh, other you know, view of the political leadership, of the uh, congressional uh, or, you know, uh, as a constituency in, in, in Moscow uh, ideas or concerns or interests. And what expert can provide is just a, a repertoire of, of possible uh, decisions. And, uh, and it's not uh, guaranteed that any of his suggestions will be uh, taken uh, into account by the policymakers. Uh, what, uh, what is a major uh, uh, you know, it's a challenge for, for a, an expert. An expert, sh probably if he wants, he or she uh, wants to, to influence somehow the political uh, decisions about the uh, other country, he probably needs to be as well uh, knowledgeable about the domestic politics as he knows the other country. And uh, the major uh, task, the major challenge for an expert is not just to know everything about the other country, but to know how to marriage, to marry this knowledge about the other country with a domestic concern, and to reach uh, those, uh, you know, effect, uh, to reach those res results that can be, uh, you know, fruitful and uh, had a had a better future, because uh, otherwise. Uh, the political circle will just abandon the, uh, the idea about the, f the another country. What we see uh, very frequently in the history of Russian-American relations on both sides in, in different uh, periods of time, when uh, the better future for the Russian-American relations uh, were a sacrifice for the domestic concerns. It was many times it happened on the Russian side. It happened on the American side as well. As well when uh, the better future for the relations was sacrificed because some domestic uh, agenda required to have a uh, big, uh, like, boogeyman or some, some big, big uh, threat getting from, from a different uh, side of the Atlantic. And, uh, well, uh, those such a periods of domestic life may be uh, not last long, but the uh, series of image of the other country as a threat uh, survives those periods. And there no, uh, can be, um, you know, uh, can be used on the next generations of American or Russian politicians uh, in order to, uh, you know, in, in order to, to start another wave of uh, mutual uh, mistrust. Uh, Angela said uh, very wisely that uh, there was a, mm, okay, I just forget I did, uh, what, what, what I wanted to say here, but well, uh, sorry, <laughs> I, just, I just started. Uh, with, with but it was definitely very wise. <laughs> it was very wise, yeah, <laughs> it was very wise, yeah. Uh, by definition, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, again, uh, so the, my, my major major idea here is that uh, George Kennan uh, biographies, George Kennan's uh, uh, experience uh, was, uh, you know, uh, a combination of his deep knowledge and his deep, uh, profound thinking, and uh, several, uh, or you know, probably the one but very important period of time when his knowledge and his advice was uh, resonated to to. American uh, shortage of, of, of uh, thinking in, in, in Washington in the late 40s. But he lived very long t life. And uh, during different periods of his life, he, get back with, he got back with his new ideas about the Russian-American relations, about world politics. And most of those ideas were not, no, uh, not noticed by in Washington, not used in Washington. And that's uh, something which uh, uh, speaks a lot about the experts' role and the experts' ideas. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan.
You know, I'll note that it's striking. Uh, I think we spent a lot of time now in Washington contemplating the dilemma for those with knowledge, those with expertise to marry, I think was your term, themselves to politics and, and political relevance. But it's striking that both of our Russian speakers made that point about the, the paucity, the absence, the difficulty, about ref the lack of reflection, the lack of knowledge, the lack of rigor. And I am sure, without even having to ask, that Russian experts face the same dilemma in trying to make their ideas relevant in their political sure. context. So this is something universal which Kenan clearly tapped into. Ambassador Taft, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a perfect lead-in. Thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful to be on this panel. I'm obviously not a scholar like my three predecessors. Uh, so I thought I'd use my time to say a few words about the significance of George Kennan for me and for, I think, many of the American diplomats of my generation. There are a number in this room, and I uh, encourage you, if you disagree with what I'm about to say, please jump in at the end and uh, correct, correct or uh, uh, add to what I had to say. What I mean by this is the American Foreign Service officers who began working on the Soviet Union, whose work has continued through the demise of the USSR into the post-Soviet world. If my memory serves me well, uh, the first time I really focused on George Kennan was during the mid-1970s. I was a young Foreign Service officer working at the State Department during Henry Kissinger's first term as Secretary of State, or his term as Secretary of State. And I remember reading that first volume of Kennan's memoirs during that period and being struck at how this young man from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, made his way to Princeton and then into the Foreign Service. Well, as a Wisconsin boy myself, who'd grown up in Madison and gone to school in Milwaukee at Marquette University, before joining the Foreign Service, I was, of course, impressed by the similarities in our background. That, that's about where all the similarities <laughs> ended. <laughs> but most importantly, I was humbled, uh, and I mean that in a very sincere way, by Kennan's academic achievements and his language skills. Uh, I was struck by his role in particular in not only being an active diplomat, but also by his desire to really contribute to the formulation of American foreign policy. Kennan and other FSOs like Chip Bolin, and Avis is here, uh, became in a way models for those of us who chose the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe more generally as our career path and who sought to have an impact on the evolution of our policy as the Soviet Union imploded and the new nations of the former Soviet Union came into being. I should also mention at this point that one of Henry Kissinger's main staff members at this point was Larry Eagleburger, who was also a native of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a fact not lost on me or the few other Wisconsin natives at that time in the State Department. Mm -hmm. Although I never met George Kennan, I did later in my career, from 2003 to 2004, serve as the senior State Department officer at the uh, National War College in the very de deputy commandant position in which Kennan had served in 1946. And I sat for a year in the office there and at the desk, which I was told George Kennan actually used, in which he wrote a good portion of the Mr. X article. You can, I think, still go and see that today. I thought it more than a little ironic that I took this position immediately after serving as U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania, during which NATO took the decision to admit the Baltic nations to NATO membership, a decision, as we've heard already, that George Kennan strongly opposed. As you can imagine, I, uh, I was constantly teased at the War College when I was there about when I was going to write my own Mr. X article. Uh, well, my friends are still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Like Kennan, I used that year at the War College to ground myself in some of the classics of strategy. Although I'd studied history, I'd never engaged in any kind of serious examination of how nations develop national strategies, certainly with the rigor with which they teach it at the War College. We also undertook a deep study of realism and idealism in foreign policy with a focus at that time on the then raging Iraq War. But inevitably, the discussion also drew me back to a concerted look at the role of U.S. policy in the post-Soviet Union. I think most of my colleagues at State during these, these years understood clearly the role of Kennan and his articulation of the policy of containment. We were all, in many ways, his intellectual protégés. But we also understood how our policy had evolved since the time of the long telegram in ways that Kennan disagreed with to combat the Soviet, uh, to combat with military means the threat which the Soviet Union embodied. I would note parenthetically that I was made keenly aware of the Soviet willingness to use force during my first week on the Soviet desk in 1983 when the Soviet Air Force shot down the Korean airliner. 
Uh, and subsequently, when Russia walked out of the arms control talks, I think this had a huge impact on certainly me and I think a lot of the other officers who worked there. Similarly, the changes then which Gorbachev and later Yeltsin brought about leading to the demise of the USSR seemed to open up for us a new set of strategic opportunities, both with, with which to engage Russia, and that's important, but also the successor states that emerged from the USSR. Frequently, I would come back to Kennan and his ideas. I would read his interviews and criticisms of the Clinton administration and the Bush administration policies on Iraq and particularly on NATO enlargement. I was only too aware of the contradictions, I think, in his approach, which his critics did not hesitate to point out. Too often at that time, he seemed almost to be on the verge of preparing, preferring the continuation of the status quo rather than trying to deal with what we saw as new opportunities as well as dangers of the post-Soviet era. In those days, it seemed to many of us that the time had arrived to right the wrongs of Yalta, and it would give the nations of Central and Eastern Europe the chance to develop new, independent, and hopefully democratic societies, which would enhance the interests of their people, and in the process, build a new order in Europe, a Europe whole, free, and at peace. At the same time, and again, I want to emphasize this, the Clinton administration made a very strong attempt to build a role for Russia in this emerging post-Soviet world, an approach which I know had broad support in American society. In 1996, I became the deputy chief of mission at the American Embassy in Moscow. I served for four months with Tom Pickering, Ambassador Tom Pickering, and then it began a period of 10 months when I was the chargé d'affaires. I was in charge of the embassy before Ambassador Jim Collins arrived in September of 97. During this period, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright held several meetings with Russian Foreign Minister Yevgeny Primakov with a particular focus on finishing the negotiations of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. I have to be careful because I don't think a lot of this has been declassified yet, but I will just say to you that time and again, I was in the room next to the secretary and I saw her seemingly bend over backward in these negotiations to try and accommodate Russian concerns, frankly, often based on misunderstandings of what NATO was and its mission. And to find a place for Russia within this new security architecture which the Clinton administration was trying to build with our European allies in Europe. Alas, this was in the end, as we know, to no real avail. And I'm well aware of those who argue that it was a foolhardy mission in the first place. But I honestly, and again, I speak very frankly, don't think the Russia side took advantage of the new possibilities, which really were offered and discussed at that time. Well, today we have a situation which is even more complicated as we try to find a way to deal with our differences over Ukraine, and with Russian cyber attacks on our democratic institutions. I often wonder how George Kennan would think about these issues today. Would he see Russian behavior with all the new informational and military technologies and the techniques of hybrid warfare as a further, threat, a further set of threats to be contained? And if so, how? Through political means, more sanctions, or through a more militarily robust containment? more aggressive counter cyber steps. But beyond Russian policy, and I'm getting to a point that Andre raised, how would Kennan see Russian society today and the way it has changed? In many ways, Russia is still searching for its identity in the post-Soviet world. How would Kennan view resurgent Russian nationalism under Putin and the lack of Russian understanding of national sentiments among the nations of the former Soviet Union? What would he think of the new generations of young Russians? Not just those who are out on the street following Navalny and demonstrating, but many, many more who I encountered everywhere I traveled in Russia as the American ambassador. How would he react to the continuing war in Ukraine and Russia's isolation in many ways from the West? What kind of future would Kennan see for Russia's relations with many of its immediate neighbors who view Moscow today with great suspicion, if not downright hostility? But I think I've already started moving into the discussion for this afternoon, so maybe I'll stop there, Matthew, and uh, be, say that I'll be happy to hear your reactions and uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. All right. Well, 
Thank you very much uh, to all four of our panelists. Uh, John, you really uh, raised far more question marks uh, than, than applied periods, I think, there. Uh, that most likely was your purpose, and you were invited to do that. So thank you. We've got um, a good 20 minutes now because we're gonna. We started late, so we'll we'll push the session by 10 minutes. Uh, we can have some some Q and A and some discussion. Um, so all I ask, you know, keep your hand up high. It's pretty hard to see against the Klieg lights here. And then uh, wait for the microphone. Identify yourself and put a question mark at the end of your question. And uh, if, if you don't have any forthcoming, or maybe if I just decide to, I'll insert the moderator's prerogative. So, please. So, um, Avis Bolin, retired uh, State Department. Speak into the mic, please. Uh, yeah, okay. Avis Bolin, uh, retired uh, State Department. I have a, a, a comment for Professor Carilla. First of all, thanks to all the panelists. It was very stimulating and, and wonderful. Um, Professor Carilla, you said that, that basically that Kennan's expertise ran up against the stone wall of domestic considerations. And I would, I would argue that um, that, that, that is true, for example, in the period of NSC 68 when another more aggressive view of the Soviet mm. Union prevailed. But in the late, um, in the late 40s, there were three initiatives that the United States took, where um, the impulse really came not from domestic considerations, but from Europe. And this was um, the Marshall Plan, where economic collapse in Europe was the impulse. Um, the, um, the NATO, where again, the impulse came very much from, from Europe against initial hesitation in the, um, in the United States and uh, the creation of a West German state, all building blocks of the, of the Cold War order. And there, um, it, was, it was the Europeans who were driving these policies, and Kennan really kind of did not get the picture in Europe, and one can argue this is, was one of, his, one of his greatest failings, that he did not understand what the, what the Europeans wanted, and this is, I think, particularly true of NATO, where he had a number of good um, critiques about NATO, it would divide okay. the continent. Russia was not a military, but he did not capture the very right. fearful mood of the Europeans, which in the end was was uh, decisive okay. for the creation. And um, so I just I just <coughs> okay. okay. Let's let's take one or two more, and then we'll we'll go back to those who wish to respond. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the back there first, and then Wayne. Uh, the two of you, uh, go, go ahead first to Ross. Yeah. And then Wayne. Thanks. Uh, Ross Johnson, Wilson Center. Um, how do we understand um, uh, an another uh, current of um, Kennan's thinking about containment, which was um, active rather than passive, uh, by which I mean Kennan was also the father of the concept of political warfare, and mm -hmm. in particular covert political warfare. Yep principal author of NSC 4A and so on. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, having, having um, launched that um, effort, he was very passive. Once he went to Princeton, he took no interest in the organization of some of those uh, activities, even though he was consulted. And then, of course, in the mid-'70s, became a, a very strong critic of these uh, various covert U.S. activities. Right. How to understand this part, this current in his thinking about containment? Very, yeah, important, and he wrote that that was his single biggest regret, actually. Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, as a graduate student, I was privileged to meet uh, George Kennan when I was one of Jim Billington's students, and what I remember vividly is in 1971, he was working on an article about the problems of post-Soviet Russia. Mm -hmm. 1971, he was already writing about the issues, positive and negative, that would face Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Quite extraordinary. Uh, I would just like to note that I think in terms of understanding what Kennan might think about the relationship today, I think perhaps the most valuable uh, volume of his scholarly work is one that's not read very much, which is his book about the events that took place 100 years ago today, mm -hmm. The Decision to Intervene, mm -hmm. uh, which I recently reread. And, and I think it's, uh, I've actually proposed to the Wilson Center that maybe you ought to do a panel about that part of his writings, because it's where he talks most clearly about the person and policies of Woodrow Wilson, 
is where he talks about dealing with a Russia in transition and transformation. Right. But he also talks about the relationship between the two countries. And I think if one wants to speculate, it has to be speculative about what, will, but what Kennan would say about the relationship today. I think that the X article uh, and the long telegram are perhaps a poorer guide than looking about his scholarly writings about the early period uh, of American relations with the new Soviet Union. Right. And those two volumes, particularly the second, I think really form a, a basis for trying to understand a Kennan-esque view of where we are in the 21st century. So I, I really recommend those volumes because I know they are not very well read. Thanks, Wayne. So le let me formulate these three questions with very explicit question marks. Uh, uh, you know, Avis's question about uh, n not really getting what Europe wanted then and now. Uh, and so, John, if you want to venture further forward uh, on where you left off, that would also be a great opportunity. Um, but, but likewise, uh, to uh, I think it was to Yvonne that you posed that observation. Um, the the question of covert and political warfare uh, from Ross, uh, I think I mean I think it's an objective fact that that he later uh, sort of recanted his own view on that. But but if there's any thinking about that, especially now as we engage in the kind of what is it, the, the information warfare, the battle of disinformation and so forth. Um, and then Wayne's observation and questions uh, about what, you know, I think putting a very fine point on this, what Kennan really would say about the relationship today based on uh, the, the closest analogs that he actually wrote about. And I would, by the way, I'd add his uh, 1958 University of Chicago lectures uh, about late 19th century U.S. foreign policy in East Asia, although I guess we'll get to that in the afternoon. <laughs> so whoever wants to bite into any of those myriad topics. I can start first. Please, yeah, yeah Ivan. Okay, th thank you for observation, and I agree uh, that uh, Kenan was less aware about what is going on in Europe, and even less what is going on in, uh, else elsewhere in the, uh, in the, on the globe including the United States, as uh, John Geddes uh, wrote that. But this is uh, why it's actually, from my point of view, uh, reinforced my uh, my idea that it was not as much about the, his knowledge, but about the uh, relevance of his ideas to the uh, policy making. The, even without knowledge of what Europe was demanding, just uh, on the base of the uh, analysis of what uh, Soviet Union uh, represented at that point, uh, Kennan was successful in formulating the policy doctrine which actually survived along for that uh, particular time, even without knowledge of, again, again, that Europe was uh, uh, you know, lobbying for, for the Marshall Plan, for NATO, for you know, the creation of uh, West, Euro uh, West Germany. So that was... Uh, actually, uh, from my point of view, it reinforces what I, what I said, that it's uh, not as much about knowledge as about the action, and that action needed some, uh, some doctrine to, 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 to start, and that's, he was successful in uh, fitting that. And actually, just a brief uh, maybe comment a little bit to, 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 you, to, you, to your com commentary. Uh, it's, uh, it's not about uh, Kennan's view, it's about my, uh, my analysis, but uh, you know, the, uh, the big changes in the uh, policy and the big changes uh, of uh, American policy toward Russia or the U USSR or Russian policy toward uh, America happens usually when uh, the nation is in some kind of crisis. The, uh, the nation which changes the policy. <coughs> I mean, when, uh, when the United States after the Second World War felt some kind of a crisis, crisis of identity, yeah, what, what the United States was in the late 40s after the uh, war ended. Uh, that was a time when uh, Americans needed to reconsider the other, the Soviet Union, and that was the time when uh, George Kennan came with his ideas about Soviet Union and helped Americans to reconsider themselves as well as, uh, as and the American role vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Union. And when we had in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia was in the huge crisis of identity and who, are, who we are, who Russians are in, in the new world after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Russia was ready to reconsider it, so its attitude to, to the United States and then actually attempted to reconsider it in the 90s. If you go back to the uh, policy statement, uh, you know, like media uh, dis uh, discussions in the, uh, Russia in the early 90s, it was very sympathetic to America. It's very ready to, to you know, to uh, 
uh, to establish much better relations. But the United States at that time was in no crisis. The United States was very triumphalistic, I would say. And that was uh, a time when uh, the opportunity was lost, the opportunity that Russia would probably. And this, here I disagree with what uh, Angela said. And I agree with what Kennan was writing at that time. That was an opportunity. I don't mean that it was uh, you know, guaranteed that the relations will be much, much better. But at least to some extent, that was a period of, of opportunity. And what we see right now during the last year, America again in the identity crisis. I'm sorry to, to, to see it. And this is again the time when America is trying to reconsider Russia vis-a-vis -vis the new uh, American identity crisis. But this is a different topic. Thank you. Angela? J just two quick points um, to reinforce what Ava said. Um, sort of not understanding um, you know, the European part of this. One of the part of the wreath lectures that I didn't talk about here is um, that George Kennan in those lectures basically was very skeptical about whether it would be a good idea if Germany were ever reunified um, and, uh, you know, was quite critical of the German desire for this um, so that obviously it's 10 years um, after the, um, you know, the late, the late 1940s. But I think, you know, that just reinforces what you were saying. Um, and then I guess to the question of... What would Kennan think about uh, U.S.-Russian relations today? I mean, clearly, there's an element of this where he would clearly criticize the United States, again, given all of his views um, on what happened after the Soviet collapse, criticize the U.S. for many of its actions. But I think the, the more interesting question, in a way, is how would he have thought about Putin's Russia today? Given what we think he thought would happen when the Soviet Union collapsed, he maybe thought that Russia would take a different path than in fact it has taken, um, you know, and gone back to so many of the things that he talked about, uh, again, uh, 71 years ago. But I, that's obviously mu much more speculative. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, I would just make a point about uh, those of my colleagues who spent their careers in government uh, will understand that the, uh, certainly in our system, but I suspect even in the, the Russian system today, uh, we all have to take into account, keep track of, of domestic policy, not just of the administration and what the administration's either platform or uh, strategies are as it develops, but the evolving. And this is one of the hardest things for, uh, I think, a government employee or, or a diplomat today to keep track of all of those things. And there's moments when, uh, when you agree with the policy, uh, which are relatively easy because you're then trying to fill in, you're trying to come up with initiatives that will uh, bear out the policy line that the administration. The harder time is to speak truth to power uh, when it disagrees and uh, when you disagree with it and then to know how far to take it. Now you can take it to the end and you can resign and you can leave but then once you leave you don't have the chance anymore to make that statement of truth to power. Um, maybe these are obvious statements, but, uh, you know, I, through the course of my career, I've been struck with, uh, you know, when I, in graduate school, I, it, it sounded like you just uh, postulate the, uh, the, 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 the theories of the strategies and everything flows, but the personalities and all the rest of it, I think, as we all know, play so heavily in these things, and you, you have to be constantly adjusting and being prepared to figure out how best to make your arguments and push your initiatives and when to hold back uh, or when to fall back uh, to fight another day. And we know, we know from Kennan's uh, own memoirs that from the early 1960s, which was his last government service as ambassador in Yugoslavia onward, he wrestled with that problem of whether he could or should go back in through mm -hmm. politics or through appointment, again, diplomacy. Uh, and, you know, ultimately settled on a comfortable but uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, omitting to answer that question by being outside of, of the, uh, the political dilemma. Well, uh, two, two very short points, first of all, on, on covered operations. Uh, indeed, you know, Cannon uh, uh, made a reference uh, to covered operations as a, as a tool to counter the, uh, the Soviet actions. But even in his first uh, uh, papers, uh, including the, the article and the telegram, uh, he uh, cautions uh, against uh, uh, over-relying on covered operations, and he argues that we, under no circumstances, we should imitate our adversary uh, and uh, use the same methods as uh, our adversary uses. Uh, and I think that, uh, indeed, uh, uh, 
he always believed that the change should come from the inside. And uh, I think that he became so, later on, he became so critical of that because he was concerned uh, that uh, this emphasis on covert operations might obscure the vision of the U.S. policy. And I think uh, he had some reasons uh, to make uh, such uh, uh, statements. And my second point uh, is uh, on, on the NATO enlargement. Uh, I think that we, we focus a lot on, uh, on uh, the opposition by Kennan to the NATO enlargement, but I think that for him, uh, and I agree with him completely, uh, it, it was a secondary issue compared to a much more important issue of integrating Russia uh, into the Euro-Atlantic security system. Uh, because indeed, uh, if we were successful in integrating Russia, and if Russia had uh, got uh, its uh, place at the table, which was not easy because, of course, uh, that uh, should not have been done by granting Russia veto power. At the same time, Russia should have sa had okay. a say in decisions. Probably the whole issue of the NATO enlargement uh, would not uh, have uh, become so sensitive and uh, so divisive. So in, in my opinion, we should uh, uh, really focus on this aspect of his post-Cold War thinking, and he, he wrote a lot about the status of Berlin, about uh, the future uh, European security architecture. And I think this part of uh, his legacy is still valid, though, of course, uh, we cannot get back to the situation of 20 years ago. But I think it is still something that <coughs> we should keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so right there in the middle. Michael Waller, I'm with the Wilson Center Council. This uh, panel was convened in part to um, address the strategic and diplomatic challenge that Russia poses to the U.S. and its European allies and the ideal balance of confrontation and dialogue in light of that challenge. I'd be interested in this panel's reflections on um, how they would comment if this question were reversed. In other words, the strategic and diplomatic challenge that the U.S. poses to Russia and its friends, and the ideal balance, comma, if any, comma, between confrontation and dialogue that uh, the, the Russia should uh, employ against that threat. And brilliant, brilliant question, Michael. There's no Kenanism, but that's a Kenan-esque way of stepping outside, <laughs> looking as an outsider at the inside. I think that's fantastic. Anyone want to take a stab at that? Well, uh, l let, me, let me start. Uh, um, I think that uh, the reality is, and this is well understood in Moscow, to the extent of my uh, knowledge, limited knowledge of the domestic uh, developments in Russia, is that there are problems, and there are many problems, uh, which are important for Russia, which cannot be resolved without the United States. And you can talk about uh, Ukraine, you can talk about uh, Syria, you can <coughs> talk about the Russian modernization. It would be very difficult if possible, to accomplish certain goals if the United States is not benign, or at least indifferent. Uh, therefore, in this balance, which is asymmetrical, of course, Russia has a lot of stake. That's why I think there were attempts to work it out with President Trump. I think that um, these attempts reflected some misunderstanding of the U.S. political system and to some extent of how the U.S. society operates, but I think that these attempts will continue. Anyone else? Uh, when I got to Moscow in 2014, it was the wake of uh, all the events in Ukraine and the sanctions and uh, the relationship had already kind of hit pretty close to the bottom. I, like many of my colleagues at the State Department, were looking for opportunities where we could engage, where we could somehow start to slowly, incrementally start to reverse some of the process. And I frankly thought that uh, the situation in Syria at that time was the, a real possibility. And, you know, I think John Kerry, to his credit, uh, and uh, Sergei Lavrov both agreed with that. Now, you know, I don't know enough about the, the inner workings of the defense and security systems in Russia, and probably not, I don't know enough about the ones here, but try as we might, uh, we never quite got to the point where we could actually work together and develop a political process to try to move to a post-Assad uh, 
Syria. And we now find ourselves in a situation where it's becoming rapidly a regional conflict, and uh, uh, it's a mess. It's a mess uh, for us. It's a mess for Russia. How's Russia going to manage its relationship with Assad, Iran, and Israel, not to mention the United States? Um, and I, I look back on that as, a, as at least one opportunity, and I know I have Russian friends who, who agreed that that was an area where we could have done it, but we, but we lost that. Um, you know, there's probably lots of other things that we could see, but I think, you know, in the end, until my own sense is until we can sort out the, the Ukraine situation, it's, uh, we're going to be kind of condemned to a very difficult relationship here. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that George Kennan would understand that. Uh, it would be great if he, if he were here and he had a good idea to solve it, but uh, I think he'd have to go sit down with Vladimir Putin and try to do that. Thank you. <laughs> can I? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, very briefly. Uh, you know, uh, let, let me say a few words about the uh, challenge uh, as seen from the Russian, from the point of view of Russian uh, society, not from the Russian diplomats or Russian government. And we say that uh, from uh, the Russian government uh, uses American threat, at least since 2012, uh, as a pretext to crush on the civil society, on the Russian NGOs, on the Russian uh, liberal uh, media. And uh, the w well, uh, you know, and the pretext of uh, being connected somehow to uh, to American embassy, you know, as it happened in 2012, or even to uh, promote uh, the like, American-born ideas, is uh, something that can be like a bad uh, a pretext for uh, for pressing on the organization or you know, a media. From, from the Russian government. And it looks like uh, the worse uh, the Russian-American diplomatic relations, uh, the easier it's for Russian government to press the uh, Russian society. So the worse uh, the American uh, criticism towards uh, Russia as a general, you know, the worse the situation for uh, liberals in Russia. That's why liberals in Russia are had hopes for the uh, improvement of Russian-American relations. That's why Russian liberals were very, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, glad that uh, Americans elected President Trump, not because the Trump is a Russia tool, but because they said that Russia, that Trump will be somehow better in the Russian-American relations, and it will not make a pretext for Russian government to press American, uh, so-called uh, American sympathizers, as they call everybody in Russia. That's why, uh, for the Russian uh, civil society, the the hard pressure from the American uh, government is a bad sign, and that's why uh, I would say that this is something that why Russian liberals are had hopes for the better Russian-American relations. Thank you. Angela, a last word. I would just, you know, to follow on what you said, it seems to me that from the Russian, from the point of view of the people in power in Russia, the main challenge that the United States poses is to their continuation in power um, because they see America, first of all, as, you know, trying to promote, doing democracy promotion, although there's much less of that now than there was uh, in previous years. Or it's the ideas um, that are attractive to some parts of Russian civil society. Um, and so I think, and that's something which um, is not very easy to resolve um, uh, because that is part of American foreign policy. It's, it's what we believe in, and we're not going to walk back on those issues. Well, uh, I think George Kennan uh, would have taken issue with some of what he heard. Uh, I think he would have probably agreed uh, overwhelmingly uh, with much of what he heard, and he certainly would have been honored by the attention, uh, close attention given to his uh, lifetime of work and achievement in government and out of government. Uh, but I think most of all, uh, he would have felt a kinship with this panel in your erudition, uh, in your deep knowledge of Russia, uh, your attention uh, in some into your own country, whichever country it is, uh, and uh, and of course the importance of ideas in policy. So uh, I am appreciative of all of those things. I'm very grateful to all of you for taking part in this panel. I hope you all will join me in thanking them.